Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. I want to thank you for all of the support that you've given me here. If you have any questions of me, you can send me a DM on my Instagram account at J. Scott Outdoors or send me an email jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. I want to thank you guys for listening to this podcast. Um, please tell your friends about it, and I appreciate your support. I also want to thank the sponsors of this podcast. I want to thank GoHunt.com, Cody Nelson, the glassing guru. He's been on the podcast a bunch. Guys, if you need any optical uh, needs at all, anything glassing-related, tripod-related, uh, any optical questions, or if you need gear, give Cody a call at 702 847 8747. You can also text or call him on his cell phone 602-399-3699. Um, guys, use the J. Scott promo code when you're signing up for the Go Hunt Insider. That's going to give you uh, discounts. Um, right now, they're running a $50 Go Hunt Gear Shop gift card if you sign up using the J. Scott promo code. I also want to thank Kuyu Ultralight Hunting. Kuyu is a direct consumer brand, K-U-I-U dot com. Uh, the ultra, ultralight hunting gear is the gear that I have worn since uh, and used since 2010. Um, they are a direct to consumer brand. You can go to kuyu.com, order everything right there directly on the website. Also, want to point out for those of you that are near the Dallas, Texas area, they have just opened a retail location. So now they have a retail location in Dallas as well as in Dixon, California. Um, also, be looking out for the Kuyu guys um, at some of the trade shows that are coming up here in the next couple months. Thank you to Kuyu for their uh, longtime support. I also want to thank Phonescope.com. Remind you guys to use the JScott23 promo code. That's going to get you 10% off on all orders at Phonescope. And then last but not least, LathropAndSons.com. Uh, contact owner Stephen and James at LathropAndSons, 618-544-8782. Uh, they make mountain hunting boots. They have the Encompass the Mountain Hunter, and the Elite Boot. Um, again, reach out at 618-544-8782. Um, also ask them about their custom Synergy footbeds. Um, you can also check them out at lathropandsons.com. Guys, let's get right to this episode. Again, we're, we're approaching the new year of 2024. I appreciate all your support. Reach out. Love to hear from you. Let's talk about, you know, over-the-counter January archery gear, you know, pretty much the whole whole month, January, you know, 31 days, um, or 30 days, uh, how many days in January, 30, it doesn't matter, the whole month of January, uh, you've got a situation where people can, you know, literally come and buy a tag over-the-counter and go hunting. In your experience over 40 years, what is the best? say two weeks the first two weeks the last two weeks or the middle two weeks well jay i'm gonna i'm gonna explain that to you and i'll tell you i tell guys if they want to kill a monster to start on the 15th january and I, yep and i'll tell you why okay by that time those world beaters have come out of the woodwork and they're wore out now they've chased those and their guard starts to get down uh, I was fortunate enough this year that I, I got the, the governor tag uh, client uh, on the lottery. And he the said, raffle, he, the raffle the, tag. Correct, on the raffle tag. Yeah. And he told me he did not want uh, a velvet buck. And I said, well, then the only time we're going to start hunting is, will be that he'll be here the 9th and we'll start hunting the 10th of January. And the reason being I brought him in like that is it gives those bucks a, a little bit of time to get wore out chasing the does, the big bucks. And every day it gets better and better and better. And I found that we've killed some of those gigantic bucks between the 18th and the 20th, and, and they make mistakes then because they're tired. And, and they're not as knowledgeable about people being there, and they're not, they're, they're not as worried about... Uh, truck, they're more worried about breeding, and so especially with the bow, you better have everything in, in on your favor because uh, if if they got any kind of 
of, of their scruples left, they'll leave if they if you see them. So let me let me repose the question to you then. If you had to pick, if you had to pick a seven day window, a seven day window that you would say this is when eat, hunting or not hunting, if you were just going to go out and look for tooth deer in January, what is the best seven day window to see the biggest buck? I think the fifteenth on, and that's so seven days. The twenty third. Yep, I think that's 20, the best. Twenty second. Yeah, okay. and and another thing that happens that, and I know you know this, is that a lot of the does get bred in that cycle, but a lot of deer don't get bred. And once that twenty four hours is over with of their estrus, well, they'll, they'll those other deer will start coming back in, and so you you start having a lot of bucks around a doe instead of just one buck chasing them. It's not uncommon. I've seen five or six or ten bucks around one doe at the latter part of January. And, and I tell you, that's when I've seen some of the most ungodly bucks. Uh, what you, we would call, you know, uh, just 100-inch deer could, could be a satellite deer on, on <laughs> some of these these other deer, when you know, they could be two or three Boone and Crockett bucks. I've seen that, and a couple hundred inch deer, just the satellites, and so, and that doesn't happen till the end, is what I found. So you're hunting with a bow. You're hunting mid January. From a tactical standpoint, I get a lot of questions. Guys wanting to know, you know, do you sit and watch these deer? Do you try and pattern them? Do you see these deer and do you go after them right away? How aggressive do you get? Talk a little bit about, you know, 40 years of experience of trying to, you know, be successful with the bow, or do you sit water? What, what, walk through that. Well, I'm not sitting any water. That hadn't done very good for me in January. Most of it's froze anyway. Uh, and I'm not done very well at setting water. I've done well in August setting water, but not in January. But I, I, I'll tell you, everything that you mentioned, I'm doing. It depends on the deer. It depends on what he's doing. And, and if he's on one doe and he lays down, then we go 90 miles an hour after him fast and try to get close. And then even if he can't see that deer, we try to get it within shooting range so that we, when he gets up, we have a chance. And we've killed a lot of deer doing that, Jay. I, I try to be... And I try to be very aggressive, and I've done the passive stuff in the bat in the la in the, a lot of my life, and it never works out. But I found if I'm aggressive and get in close and you know and, uh, within an archery range, then just stand there, and I tell the client just stand there. He's there. He, do you see this? Yeah. Then he sta he's there. And I had a guy last year, for example, that he couldn't see the deer, and he lost what I would call that edge. He couldn't see the deer. It was a mesquite tree. And when the deer stood up, it kind of scared him. And he shot over the deer's back at 50 yards, and it ran off. And then so when he got up there, I asked him, I said, what happened? He said, he startled me. I said, well, how could it startle you? I said, I told you 50 times you just by that mesquite tree. He hadn't got up. Yeah. And he said, so what you're saying is expect it. You know, you know it's there. If you're you're talking, if you've got a spotter and your spotter saying the yes. bus by the mesquite tree, to be ready, to be expecting, and to be on go, and don't don't let your mind wander is what you're saying. It took him a day or two before he admitted it to me. To tell you the truth, he said, "He said, you know what happened there, Dwayne?" I said, "No." I said, "What happened?" He said, "I didn't think it was there." I said, well, "Why would I tell you it was there?" He said, "I know, Dwayne." He said, "I just I just figured it was." There, and he said, I was looking yeah. down at the ground, and then I told him, I said, he's, he's standing up. He stood up. Well, then by he pulled the bull back, he did everything too fast, Jay. That's what he did, and he shot yeah. over him. And I, so, but long story short, he killed a nice deer with me. You know, it's like anything else. You, you, do, you develop confidence in people, and when they tell you something, they, they, they know that you're telling the truth. And, and if you hadn't hunted with somebody a long time, it's hard to develop that, that next step. And some of those little small things is what makes, it, is what makes a guy a killer. Yeah, for sure. We've talked a little bit about this. I've talked about it with some other guys, too, on the podcast. Is, you know, talking about your hunting buddies and who you roll with, um, 
if, if you don't have utmost confidence in the guy that's watching the deer for you, then you probably need to find someone else to watch the deer for you. Um, you need to know that if someone says, I got the deer, he's bedded, you're in good position, you need to just be ready. They, I mean, you need to be ready. And when the guy says the deer is standing up and you still can't see the deer, that doesn't mean your head bobbing around and you're trying to, like, you have to have confidence that your, your eyes in the sky can see it and you need to act accordingly and you need to not be bobbing around trying to see it just so you get your eyes on it. If he says, okay, he's just feeding, okay, now he's taking a couple steps towards you, and now all of a sudden you see it. But if you're bouncing all over and moving around trying to get your eyes on it, that's not doing any good. If someone's talking in your ear and you've got an earpiece using a radio, you need to trust that person that's watching the deer for you. Jay, if you remember, one of the first things when we, I did a podcast was I told you about my boy. He, he lost a deer, yeah. and I come back yeah. and snapped his butt. But yeah. the, the the difference is is that not only is that the truth that's an absolute truth and 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 but I think you develop that and and there's a lot of good outfitters out there besides myself that develop that with clients that they trust when somebody tells them something and it's not only being paid it, it, they can pay you all you want Jay you, they've got to they got to believe what you're telling them and once they believe you then they'll jump off a cliff with you it, to to chase big stuff because they know that you're you're honest and you're trying to do your best and but but yeah. you are right that the last thing I do is and, and I tell them when you stand there do not be moving your head and I tell them on the radio I said don't move don't move you're moving your head too much I'll tell them and, and yeah. they'll stop. I'll tell you another thing, Jay, is that once you learn to, for them to, that communication back and forth, you, you become a killer. I, I had one oh, guy deadly. kill five, five deer five years in a row with me, and that's exactly, he, when I told him, he stood there one time for two hours, I said, he's right in front of you, Don, don't move. And he said, okay. And, uh, and he said, he said, I don't see it. I said, he's there. And then all of a sudden, the, I said, the deer's up. And he did the same thing. I said, don't move. He's starting to feed. Don't move. It took like 20 minutes. And then I said, you should see him now. And then all of a sudden, I see the guy pull the bow back, schwack, and hit him. And But if he'd have got excited and took a couple steps, and we'd have blown it. Yeah. No, you have to have full confidence for sure. Um, let's. let's take a time out for just a second and while this is going on we're talking about mainly hunting coos deer but one of the things for the listeners out there i get messages a lot they don't realize that that it's any deer you can hunt coos deer or mule deer talk a little bit about some of these areas Dwayne. um i know you hunt a lot in southern arizona but talk about areas that have mixed coos deer and mule deer and the fact that you can be chasing a nice desert muley or a coos deer in the same day well 33 is has got it 30 32 has got it uh 37b is just now uh they've opened it up to mule deer and coos deer and there's we're seeing more and more coos deer uh all the time in 37b and and all the, thir thir the 34, 36, and 36A, all those units are mixed down there. So you can glass a, a 180 mule deer and turn to your right and see a 100-inch coos deer at the same time. So all the all the southern zones uh, make it a lot of fun. You can chase big mule deer and, and big coos deer any second. And talk a little bit about the rut coinciding, the mule deer rut. Are they uh, the, the mule deer and the coos deer down there are they rutting exactly the same time or talk about the maybe the little slight difference of, of timing of the mule deer and the coos the mule deer generally rut earlier uh by about a week if it, it what i've noticed is that the, the desert mule deer are chasing a little bit earlier than than the coos deer but i they have a tendency i, I think to rut longer and what i mean I think by so that too. Well, I think it is because that some of the deer that, that are traveling twenty miles, Jay, and and, and twenty five miles uh, to 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 get doe. So that you know, it's not like coos deer where there's pockets and pockets of, of deer. So I, I've seen them chasing in February in pig season, still not just following the does and still trying to breed them. So uh, I think they 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 run a lot longer. Uh, because it's less deer than there is uh, for coos deer. 
you mentioned something there. You mentioned javelina, and I know a lot of people want me to talk a little bit about javelina. You've probably been around more javelina than you'd like to admit. Um, but they're a phenomenal animal that you can get a lot of, you can draw, and, and there's even some over-the-counter opportunities and, and such, and, you know, they run hunts in January and February. Um, but talk about the javelina. You've been around them and hunted them your whole life. Um, for those maybe out there that aren't as familiar, talk about them. I think that that's the, the ready-made bow hunt for any kid, elderly person, young lady, I think that's the first animal they ought to chase because you can make a lot of mistakes and you don't got to judge horns. And I tell people that all the time. <laughs> and you can shoot a, a, a nice pig and, and you get a lot of experience on stocking. That's, that's what I really try to tell young guys that come by here and, and talk to me. I say, stock them pigs. If you make a lot of mistakes, you won't make those mistakes when you, you start stocking deer. And uh, you... I, I tell most people, for every shot that you're going to get with a with a, with a bow at a deer, that's about 15 stocks per shot. And they say, "Is that right, Mr. Adams?" I said, "Well, you, that's what it is for me." Until I started using the radios and all the stuff that I do, but if until you start learning the stock, so you're probably going to get a couple shots the whole season. Is what you're probably going to get. So the best thing to do is learn how to stalk. And, and most people don't know how to stalk. I, I, I mean, it, it took me years to figure out all the mistakes, you know. They move too fast when they should move slow, and they move too slow when they should move fast. And, and it's really that important. When, when I tell these guys, run, get over there, get over there, go as fast as you can. So I see them lollygagging. I tell them on the radio, I said, get over there, keep going. I'll tell you when you need to rest, and this ain't the time to rest. Yeah, specifically on these um, javelina, what, if you were specifically targeting javelina, what are some of the things that you're looking for out there on the hillside um, or the terrain or vegetation? or what, what are you looking for for prime javelina country? Prickly pear. That's, that's about 60% of their food. They eat it year-round, and they love prickly pear cactus. And there's a bunch of other little cactuses out there that they like, too, like a hedgehog. That's, that's a different cactus. And, and they like those shin daggers, that little ball that, that the shin daggers are in. But uh, those three foods right there, if you, if you don't have them, you're pretty tough to find pigs. They love, they love all three of those. Talk so about, that's, that's uh, what I'm looking for. One thing I like about pigs, too, is it's, I mean, literally, you can glass pigs up during the middle of the day. They don't necessarily, like, bed down unless it's really, really hot. I mean, it seems like they're always out on an open hillside, prickly pear hillside, ocotillo hillside. It seems like they're always out there feeding and rooting around. It's a pretty target-rich environment, and it's a great hunt, I think. That's exactly right. Like I said, it, uh, I have a gentleman coming this, this year that's going to hunt with us, and uh, he's going to hunt. The, the deer with his with his uh, compound, and he's going to hunt the javelina with his recurve. And I said, I said, yeah. He said, is that is that possible? I said, sure, it's possible. I said, all day. I said, you can leave your recurve there and go and go chase the bucks. And then if we see a javelina, just leave that and take it over and go over. And I've had that happen uh, probably twenty, thirty times in my career with clients and. Uh, and actually, they all kill pigs, so it, it make they have missed two or three different batches. But you're right; in the middle of the day, you can always find a herd of pigs. I'll tell you something else, uh, Jay, that uh, your listeners might want. It. I find probably fifty percent of the pigs by sound and not by glassing. And when they're what are you fighting, listening for? they fight, Jay. You can hear them go, row, 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 row. And that, they'll do it just like that, and I'll tell the guys, there's pigs over there somewhere. And you span over there and listen, and whatever they're fighting over, but they'll, they, they'll fight, and they'll do it two or three times before whichever one whips the other one. And, and that's how I find a lot of pigs. You can hear them fighting. Yeah, I, I can't tell you how many times you're just sitting there glassing and you're looking for deer and you hear that. I mean, it's, you hear it every day almost if you're in pretty good habitat. You can hear them from a long ways away. So That's right. I would agree, I would agree with that. So it's, it's a neat animal to hunt. Well, 
uh, Dwayne, another awesome podcast. God bless you, okay? God bless you, Jay, and God bless America. All right, buddy. Take care. Bye-bye.